want to welcome uh, those of you joining here at the Wisconsin Energy Institute and welcome to those uh, joining online through Zoom. Um, my name is Scott Williams. I'm the Research and Education Coordinator at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. Um, and uh, this is a, a monthly series called the Forward in Energy Forum that we run um, usually the last Tuesday of the month um, during the fall and spring semesters. Um, and if this is your first time joining us for an event um, at the Wisconsin Energy Institute, uh, our mission is to provide leadership on campus for multidisciplinary research, education, and outreach efforts that accelerate the world's transition to clean energy systems and solutions. So the Forward and Energy Forum is part of our efforts at WI to cultivate public understanding of energy issues. And it's a monthly series that brings together experts both on and off campus with the goal of encouraging cross-disciplinary dialogue to explore the important technical, social, political, and economic dimensions of a wide variety of clean energy innovations and topics. So regarding today's topic, uh, one only needs to step outside for a few seconds on this uh, record temperature day to appreciate uh, our topic. Um, as climate change is making our weather more variable and unpredictable, um, it's important for the resiliency of our food system and our energy infrastructure to have accurate and timely weather and environmental information uh, in order to manage that uh, unpredictability. Um, so I look forward to hearing uh, from our panel today uh, about the ways in which a uh, new initiative called WiscoNet uh, can help in that regard. Uh, but before we get into today's uh, session, I have a few announcements. First, uh, we would like to acknowledge, acknowledge that the land that WEI occupies, as well as all of UW-Madison, is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk people, uh, who have called this land De Jope since time immemorial. We recognize and respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the 11 uh, Native nations within the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin, and I encourage you all to learn more about and support the efforts of tribal nations in Wisconsin and beyond uh, who are leading the transition toward clean and just energy systems. Next, I invite you all to come to the Wisconsin Kidwin Challenge uh, happening this Saturday on March 2nd. Um, you'll get to see elementary, high school, and middle school teams uh, show off their wind and solar energy de uh, designs. Um, this also includes a public science expo from 10 to 12 um, that has hands-on learning stations uh, for all ages. And so you can come uh, swing by the Discovery Building uh, anytime uh, during the day, uh, but especially between 10 and 12 uh, to take part in that. In our next forum, i uh, ask you to save the date for April 23rd. Um, we're skipping our March forum due to the spring break, um, but we have some other exciting events planned for April, uh, including our forum on April 23rd, which is uh, the history and future of energy research at UW. And um, we're doing this in conjunction with the 175th anniversary uh, of the campus, uh, as well as the Earth Fest, which is taking place that week as well, um, hosted by the Nelson Institute and the Office of Sustainability. So more, more details to come on that. Um, uh, keep tabs with our newsletter or go to our website for more information. Then finally, some uh, logistical notes. Um, we'll have opening remarks from our panelists and from Q&A uh, from our moderator before taking audience questions. Um, we'll try to alternate between in-person and online questions. If you're in-person, um, we can either bring the mic to you or we can have our moderator or, or panelists uh, repeat your question for the online viewers. Um, for those online, you can use the Q&A box uh, to submit your questions and we'll relay that uh, to the folks in the room here. Um, we do have live captioning for folks online too, so you can toggle that feature uh, by clicking the show captions button. Uh, if you have any other technical concerns uh, for those online, uh, you can use the, the chat feature. All right, now with that, uh, to moderate today's panel and set the stage for our discussion and to introduce the topic overall, um, I'm pleased to introduce Chris Kuchark. Uh, he is a professor of plant and e agroecosystem sciences here at UW-Madison. His research program incorporates fieldwork on cropping systems, ecology, and ecosystem modeling in a framework that is geared toward understanding the impacts of climate change and land management on the provisioning of ecosystem goods and services. He's also the director of the new WiscoNet project, which is the focus of today's discussion, and he'll share more about. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So. I've got just a few slides here to help uh, set the stage, uh, give you a little bit of background on what we're actually talking about. The first is, what 
is a mesonet, and that generally is uh, described as a, a network of automated uh, weather stations that are in close proximity to one another. We're talking about tens of miles, typically. Um, and they're reporting uh, really high frequency of observational weather and or soil data uh, to track things at a, what we call a mesoscale uh, scale and phenomenon of weather that happens at that scale. Um, so uh, the reason we're here and talking about this is really, you know, an idea that, you know, a lot of us have had for a long time, but some funding fell into place uh, in the last couple of years. The first was which through uh, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, which is supporting the infrastructure uh, for the Mesonet with uh, the equipment and sensors uh, being supported by that funding. And then the, the personnel, uh, all of which are sitting in the room today with us, are supported by USDA uh, grant, which was a part of a agricultural, agricultural appropriations bill led by Tammy Baldwin in 2022 that led to the creation of the Rural Partnerships Institute here at uh, UW-Madison. Um, that influx of funding is partially supporting the creation of WiscoNet and standing that up, as well as the revitalization of the Wisconsin State Climatology Office. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more from Steve Avaris uh, in a bit, who directs that office now. So uh, WiscoNet is, you know, our, our mission statement is very simple. We want to be building and maintaining an elite environmental observation network here in the state that provides timely and accurate data that can be useful across a whole segment of resource management, research, industry decision making, and beyond. And what are we actually measuring? Um, your standard fare of meteorological uh, observations, uh, temperature, dew point, humidity, rainfall, solar radiation, wind speed, direction, the gust, barometric pressure, and leaf wetness. Um, this picture here is just an example station up in the Door County area, one of our apple grower uh, collaborators. Uh, below the ground, we're measuring soil temperature and moisture um, at a variety of five depths, um, 5, 10, 20, 50, and 100 centimeters. So that's ranging from basically two inches down to about 40 inches uh, below the surface. Um, right now we have uh, 20 current stations. Those are the red dots, the circles on the map. Our goal is to get to about 80 to 90 um, in the next few years uh, with a rough goal of having at least one station in each county. Um, and there will be some clusters of, of higher density, as you can see already, uh, kind of in the apple and cherry growing region of Door County. Um, we are part of the national U.S. Mesonet program, so we're feeding data into a national program that gets used by a variety of other entities. Um, and as we're building this out, we're, we're getting input and information and guidance from a variety of other agencies and organizations across the state, uh, National Weather Service, our Department of Ag here in the state, Department of Natural Resources, uh, UW Extension, uh, our grower organizations, the tribal nations, as well as our K-12 schools uh, and those systems. So uh, the website that's been built um, is been up since uh, last June. Um, you can go there and, and browse the data, download data. You can get current snapshots. Um, this is kind of the dashboard of what it looks like. This is, we'll, we'll continue to grow and mature as we spend more time. Uh, we're bringing in another uh, hire in the next couple of months to help with the front end web development to get products out uh, to the public uh, and beyond. All right, so that's enough from me for opening a remarks to set the stage. So I wanna introduce the panel. Um, and this is an order in which they're going to give their remarks. So uh, Sarah Marquardt is here. She's the senior service uh, hydrologist at the National Weather Services office in Milwaukee and Milwaukee Sullivan. Next to her is Steve Vavaris, who's the Wisconsin State Climatologist. He's with, also with the Center for Climatic Research here at UW-Madison. Uh, sitting next to him is Amanda Gevins, who's a department chair and professor in plant pathology here at UW-Madison. And to her right is Megan Levy, who's the state, local, and tribal territorial project manager in the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response at the U.S. Department of Energy. So thank you all for giving up your time and joining us today. Um, so we're going to have them give some opening uh, remarks and, and statements based on their perspectives and 
views of how this um, WiscoNet is uh, valuable to each uh, from their perspective. And then uh, I'll probably have a little bit of Q&A with them before we go to the audience. Uh, okay, so Sarah, we're gonna start with you. Okay, thank you, Chris. So again, my name is Sarah Marquardt. I'm the Senior Service Hydrologist at the National Weather Service. So at the National Weather Service, we provide forecasts and that information is available to the public and decision makers and anyone who needs it. And another big component of our job is to issue weather warnings for public safety. So those are things like the warnings you see on TV or what you get on your phone. So the WiscoNet data, that's more data, more data is gonna result in better forecasts and that's gonna benefit everyone. And that's also gonna benefit National Weather Service forecasters, that's more data to look at, that's gonna help them better make a decision to make better warnings, get that forecast out there sooner so people can get the message to seek shelter and take shelter from that storm. So this data is gonna be, it's gonna be better all around in terms of weather and really useful during hazardous weather. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few examples of how we use this in different weather situations. So precipitation varies a lot from location to location. And the WiscoNet data is measuring what's happening on the ground. And we need that observation to calibrate what the radar is measuring. Each weather system is a little bit different. And every time it rains, we use the observations on the ground to calibrate, see how good the radar is doing, and make adjustments to it. So not only are we going to get additional data on the ground to measure how much rain has occurred, but we'll have better radar estimates so we can assess flood risk across the entire state of Wisconsin. And then we'll ass assess areas that are getting heavy rain and we can put out that flash flood warning sooner with better data to get the uh, message out to the public to seek higher ground if they're in a heavy rain risk area. During winter weather, this data will be really helpful if we're assessing areas that we may get winter precipitation, areas that may have hazardous road, road conditions because of yeah. snow or freezing rain. So imagine if there's a cold front moving across the state and we're expecting rain to change to snow. With the higher density of the WiscoNet data, we'll better be able to locate that location of the front down to the county level, see where that front is. We can do that by looking at the temperature data, the wind direction data, see where that front is. We can track the speed that it's moving so that we can provide a better forecast of when is that front gonna impact a certain location when may the rain change to snow in that location? And we can message that to other partners like the Department of Public Works, and then they can make their decision on do they need to treat the roads and when do they wanna get out there to treat the roads. And it's also gonna help with thunderstorm forecasts. So uh, a lot of times thunderstorms form along a warmer cold front. So with a higher density of this network, we'll be able to better identify where that front is and provide a more pre precise location of where those thunderstorms may form. So for example, say the forecast says we're expecting a chance of thunderstorms across Southern Wisconsin. With the WISCO net data and this additional data, we may better be able to pinpoint where that front is and say it's situated across Dane County or Madison. We can then say thunderstorms are forecast across Southern Wisconsin, including the Madison area and more pinpoint that area of concern for the hazardous weather. A few weeks ago, we had a couple of tornadoes in southern Wisconsin, and the, the WiscoNet data was really helpful that day. Our forecasters were looking at that data that morning to assess the trends in the atmosphere to see what is the threat for thunderstorms. The day prior to that, we, the ingredients were in place. We were thinking there were going to be thunderstorms. And we knew they could be severe, but there was a big question of if they would form. We didn't know if we would get to that critical temperature. So the day of those tornadoes, we were watching the WiscoNet data, looking at the, the minute by minute updates, watching that temperature trend. And we were seeing that those temperatures were increasing a little bit faster than they were in the forecast yesterday. So we realized by mid morning that the, the environment was getting to that critical temperature where thunderstorms would be able to develop. So at that point, we were able to switch our messaging from instead of saying there's a chance of thunderstorms later, we then switched it to say we are expecting thunderstorms later and we are expecting them to be severe and there is a tornado risk. So by mid-morning, we were able to get that amplified message out to our partners. And we worked directly with 
school districts, the Department of Public Works, county emergency managers to get them that information. So then they got that updated information about the threat, the, the increasing threat. They got that sooner because of that WISCONET data. And during the severe weather operations, we're looking at that data to help assess the magnitude of the storm. So the radar can, can determine the strength of the storm further up in the atmosphere, but now we have additional wind sensors that are telling us the magnitude of the winds on the ground. So that if we see a, a trend in increasing wind magnitude, we can get that warning out sooner for to get the message out to people to seek shelter. So those are just a few examples of how we're using this data. So we're really excited to have all this data and it, it comes directly into our system. So we're looking at it every day, all the time. Well, following up on Sarah, um, I'm also pro mesonet. So <laughs> since I'm up here, um, so the state climatology office has a somewhat different perspective in terms of the usage of the mesonet data, the WiscoNet. Um, but our mission is all about uh, providing climate and weather services that involve uh, informing, interpreting, and investigating. And the Mesonet, uh, the WiscoNet provides information that supports all of those. So obviously informing, right, is raw data. You can get it online. That's information that we need. Interpreting, um, as I'll mention in a moment, uh, how we use that information, uh, you know, digesting it, um, as Sarah described, in terms of the weather perspective, but we can also do it in terms of climate, like last summer's drought, uh, and then investigating. And this is something that's still to be tapped in Wisconsin um, as we get more capacity in the office. I'm looking forward to, to um, probing that more. But um, as I'll give examples of in other states, people are using their versions of WiscoNet widely in all sorts of different applications that have a variety of societal benefits. And to me, the, the, there's a, four major benefits uh, with this new network, because, you know, admittedly, we have a lot of weather data out there already. We have airport stations, we have co-op stations, Cocoa Rao stations. Um, there's a lot of weather data out there. But the, the niche that I see it from WiscoNet is, number one, it's high-quality data. Um, not all data is. I mean, it's, it, it varies depending on your sensors, depending on your um, how much care and, and location of the sites that, where you put the equipment. Uh, it's continuous, five minutes, real time. Uh, we have a lot of good quality airport data. Dane County Regional Airport has some of the best climate data around, but it comes in hourly, and sometimes you want it faster than that. And so essentially it's real time every five minutes. And then comprehensive, um, set all 72 counties being covered in Wisconsin guarantees a good density. And then as Chris mentioned, there's some extras, um, maybe 10 or 20 more um, uh, to make for a total of 80 to 90. And then it's also consistent meaning that the equipment is the same everywhere. Uh, and so when you get information from one part of the state, you can directly compare it to another. So, you know, Weather and soil conditions in, in Burlington, uh, compare it directly to conditions in Bayfield. You can't always do that if people are using disparate equipment, they're using their homemade rain gauge or temperature sensors from different uh, locations and so forth. Uh, so those are some of the, the overview big pictures of how I see it benefiting the state and also um, our mission in the State Climatology Office. But a few examples of the MesoNet in action uh, with WiscoNet, one of the things that was so useful last summer when we had the terrible drought is that it would provided a way to complement human observers on the ground describing how, how dry it was. So it's very useful to have qualitative data. Uh, for instance, a farmer saying, my creek just dried up. That hasn't happened in the 25 years that I've been farming this land. That's really useful information, but it is qualitative and sometimes things like that are subjective. Whereas the mesonet, the WiscoNet data uh, are, are objective. They're, they're calibrated, they're, they, you can take it as is. Um, and that information is very useful because drought, uh, in addition to summer thunderstorms, uh, can be very localized. And so depending on the luck of the draw, one county may be fortunate to get plenty of uh, passing showers and thunderstorms in the summer and the adjacent county isn't. And so being able to pinpoint those kind of uh, dryness indicators is really useful. And it also has a dollars and cents implication because the U.S. Drought Monitor, which is updated each week to assess drought conditions around the country, the, the drought relief dollars depend on which county uh, happens to fall into a particular drought category. So we've got to get this right. It, it's a dollars and cents issue for farmers in particular. So that's one of the important benefits of the, the WiscoNet. 
And then some examples from other states that I look forward to tapping either directly or as examples for Wisconsin. Um, the South Dakota State Climate Office has used their version of the WISCO net to provide guidance to soybean farmers uh, to give an online tool about when it's safe to spray for the, on their crops. So depending on wind conditions and temperature inversion conditions, how stable the atmosphere, resistance to mixing, um, they have an online tool that's updated and, and hour by hour, there's a, a red light, green light, yellow light system uh, to say, you know, red light means it's too windy or turbulent, don't spray, green light means it's okay, and then yellow, it's sort of in between, use caution. That's a very practical way of using this kind of mesonet data. Uh, another example that came out of the, climate, or the, the Kansas State Climate Office is called the Animal Comfort Index, which is uh, a tool for guiding livestock farmers based on their, their version of the WISCO net uh, that tells farmers uh, who have livestock if it's getting too hot and sometimes too cold, but especially whether it's getting too hot uh, for safety for their, their uh, animals. And so unlike just the, the uh, temperature like heat index in the summer that takes into account temperature and humidity, the animal comfort index takes temperature, humidity, wind speed, and solar energy into account. And it's updated every five minutes. So that's a lot more information. And we all know on a hot summer day, if you're out in the sunshine and there's no wind, it feels a lot hotter than if it's cloudy and there's a good breeze going. And it's the same for livestock. And then a final example comes from uh, what I just heard recently from the New Jersey State Climatology Office, and they're using their WISCO net or have used it um, when they had a major hurricane a couple of years ago and they had terrible flooding and it was a flash flooding. So it was happening very rapidly and uh, a lot of there's a lot of urban places in New Jersey, of course, and they were using this, you know, up to the minute data to say like, wow, this rainfall is getting very dangerous and it's it potentially leading to dam failures. And so using that information for their emergency managers is something that they couldn't have gotten if they waited for the airport data to, to update airport observations every hour. Those airport observations are terrific, but sometimes you can't wait an hour. The rainfall is coming down so quickly uh, that it can lead to damages uh, within, uh, within a few minutes. So those are just some examples of how state climate offices around the country are using the, the WISCONET data. And first example is, is one uh, Wisconsin specific. So I'm looking forward as we uh, get more stations around the state and as we get more uh, capacity within our office to be able to tap the benefits of this great new network. Thank you. Uh, my name again is Amanda Gevins, and I'm a chair of the Department of Plant Pathology and a professor and uh, an extension funded faculty member, uh, meaning that 75% it, it, of my appointment, I'm um, to work with farmers around the state of Wisconsin in uh, vegetable and potato production uh, issues, primarily in, in disease. And um, the other role that I, I hold is, is the uh, administrative director of the Wisconsin Seed Potato Certification Program. And so I, I mention all of those things because they, they'll tie into my story here. Uh, but I very much appreciate serving on this panel and being invited to do so and learning more from, from all of you um, here. It's been um, quite interesting. Um, so the, the network of uh, weather stations to agriculture is, is critical. Um, having this uniform system with the high quality weather stations across the state uh, certainly serves our um, hundred billion dollar agricultural industry um, appropriately, right? Um, we we have 14 million acres of land that are uh, producing plants in agricultural uh, systems. We we lead the U.S. in production of corn for silage, in ginseng, cranberries, snap beans for processing. Pretty much all the vegetables that are in cans or that are cubed up in soups <laughs> um, are are grown here in Wisconsin. We're a leading producer of dairy products, including cheese and butter, oats, carrots, potatoes, sweet potatoes, tart cherries, and maple syrup, to just name a few. The weather monitoring stations, uh, they enable both short and long-term benefits to agriculture. Um, and some of what I will share, uh, I, I was trying to generalize, but I can't help but infuse my own work in some of the, the comments here. Um, the individual stations will collect temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind speed, uh, in some cases, uh, solar radiation, soil temperature, and among other parameters. Uh, this allows us to develop, develop new models for uh, disease anticipation in uh, crop production. 
Um, in our department of plant pathology, I, I mentioned I work on potatoes and vegetables and hops and mint, a few other things that are not vegetables. Uh, but we have extension funded faculty members addressing uh, key crops for the state. We have a, a fruit extension pathologist. We have a, a field crops extension pathologist, turf grass, um, and an organic production specialist as well. And so uh, as a collection, we uh, all of our programs in some way um, interface with weather stations. Um, some of us in, invest in getting networked uh, data from uh, afar or from satellites, um, but all of them are rooted in the need for validation in field uh, with stations on site and on location. Uh, so these are, are very much uh, an important network of, of new and additional uh, uh, stations. So the, the models that we build or that we utilize, if they've been validated elsewhere and we've uh, adopted them here and adapted them here, uh, they, they help us to better understand and anticipate plant and animal needs, including when to irrigate, when to fertilize, or when to take action to treat to protect the health of a plant or an animal. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, herbicide usage, uh, but we use uh, these uh, weather stations to tell us when to apply a, a preventative uh, insecticide to, to manage uh, insect pests that could eat crops or that could carry pathogens to crops. And in seed potatoes, that's a big deal for us um, up in Northern Wisconsin. Um, and also gives us information uh, when to manage disease with the use of proactive uh, uh, treatments to, to limit disease like a fungicide. With shifts toward more extreme precipitation and temperature events, especially during the shoulder months, meaning our, our spring months and our fall months, uh, growers greatly benefit from better understanding uh, patterns in our weather, which impact planting, harvesting, and post-harvest transit and storage of crops. So we lose about 30% of most of our specialty crops post-harvest. Right? That's substantial. And so uh, if we can uh, better anticipate our weather, we can better uh, maintain uh, that food, feed, fiber, fuel uh, post-harvest and in that storage space. Um, I'll say in, in my 15 years here at the UW, we've had some record years. We had uh, the wettest year on record, 2010, the hottest year on record, record in 2012, right? Um, and I think the first tornado in February, just a few weeks back. So um, that's quite telling, isn't it? And it's... Um, uh, it's it's something that we uh, we work with our our grower partners uh, closely on in uh, better managing in my case disease, right? Um, so I just want to mention in in longer term, uh, I think these stations will help us um, uh, better anticipate uh, larger trends in um, in environmental. Um, conditioning in these uh, shoulder seasons, which again will help to stabilize the economy of agriculture in the state. Um, and uh, and bring more of that food, feed, fiber, fuel uh, from field to the consumer, which ultimately is uh, essential when we think about maintaining sustainability of these resources. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so as was mentioned, I'm Megan Levy. I am currently a project manager for the Office of uh, Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response for the Department of Energy. One of the reasons I'm here is because uh, for the decade plus before that, I, I was at the Wisconsin State Energy Office, where I was our uh, ESF-12, or Emergency Support Function 12 energy responder. So I got to sit in the state EOC and see Sarah give us briefs often on weather and uh, also maintained the Wisconsin Degree Days website. So I uh, would often contact Steve's office for an estimate or two <laughs> when one of our stations went bad. Um, and I'm a lifelong fan of potatoes. So Amanda's work is fascinating to me. Um, so it couldn't be in better company, frankly. Um, but I would just say, this is so exciting, not just because collecting those daily temperatures for that Degree Day site has been a real slug um, for the energy office, but it's so great. And they should really be involved in this WiscoNet project because there's so much implication for energy. So I, I understand you almost had someone from the Mid-Continent Inde Independent System Operators Network here, and, and I apologize uh, <laughs> that they weren't here for you. But uh, from the perspective of energy security, what our office does is really try to ensure reliable, resilient energy of all kinds for the entire country. So it's a little bit of a lift, you know what I mean? Um, there's, there's just, we don't own or operate any of the assets, but we have, to, we have to monitor them. And part of what I do on the state, local, tribal, territorial team is work with 
all of those entities in really assessing risks to that energy infrastructure, to that resilient, reliable energy that we're so used to, that we need all the time for our devices and everything that we do to be able to be on this Zoom today, right? So if those tornadoes that we're watching, you know, make it this way, just just take shelter and we're recording this. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I heard it right away, you know, Sarah talked about risk assessment. And this is something we're actually producing the first guide for states right now. And, and one of the biggest things that you have to think about when risk to energy infrastructure, natural and physical hazards, and they're changing. You know, yes, there are yahoos out there shooting at substations and I can't fix that right now. But um, But what we can do is try to anticipate climate impacts and try to learn from what we've seen. I, rem I remember 2012, it was 80 degrees in March. And then we had that snow that came in April and the cherry, oh geez, you know, it was really bad for the trees. Um, and it's difficult to predict. One of the big risks that uh, NERC, the North American Electric uh, Reliability Corporation has called out in their uh, assessments is the inability to forecast peak demand. So that's a big problem, especially when you're trying to use all these different intermittent sources because we're trying to get to the clean energy revolution because we'd, we'd rather not, you know, burn petroleum. But as soon as, you know, like take, for example, New England area, all of their generation units have mostly transitioned from coal to gas to methane and their backup fuel is distillate, is number two fuel oil. You know, so when they have to start burning that, and we have a Northeast Home Heating Oil Reserve in New England, which is my least favorite acronym, the NEHOR. Yeah. Um, because in government, it's a lot of na acronyms. You know, you got to have fun with it. But it's only a million barrels of oil. They can burn that in one or two days in January if it's cold enough. If we get a polar vortex that are, and I'll look at my colleagues over here, I think pretty hard to predict. And there are some creepy talk of having some polar vortex in March that I don't want to hear. Um, but, you know, as, as the jet stream degrades, as these different currents and things that we've always been used to, this is the way the weather is, it's changing, right? And so we have to be able to get in front of it. We have to understand what happens when half of Canada is on fire to our solar production in the continental United States. You know, sea level rise is not just a big deal for the coast. We also have territories out there that are losing landmass. American Samoa is 75 gross square miles, right? Like, that's tiny. You don't have room for a landfill anymore. So um, I really wanted to start this by talking about increased LAPFM and how great Wisconsin is at weather. Like, we have the father of the weather service here from our state because he just started writing stuff down. It's important enough here in the mid latitudes where our weather is extreme, <laughs> as uh, as was mentioned at the at the kickoff. Um, but it's important all over the place. So, you know, I can I can try to answer some questions about how you know how we're working to do more probabilistic uh, forecasting versus deterministic versus like, hey, it's going to be this time on this day because frankly, we have to have some wiggle room. I think if anyone's watching the Energy Reliability Council of Texas and what's been going on there in terms of not being able to meet demand, uh, it's, it's a big, big problem that we have with our energy infrastructure, with being able to deliver the energy that people expect to their homes. Um, so again, uh, we have a wide-ranging mission at Caesar. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about additional data like this because the only way that we can really prepare for and mitigate these risks is to understand them. And so this is this is really a great day. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Well, thank you all. That was I learned a lot just in the last uh, ten or fifteen minutes, and really appreciate the the detailed comments and perspectives. So, thanks for taking the time to do that. I'm sure the audience appreciates that too. Um, such a wide range of of thoughts here. Um, so, I've got a few questions. I think I'm going to go through and, and ask and um, get a little perspective. And feel free to cross talk if you want and, and respond to each other. And then we'll head to the the audience um, online. So the first is for Sarah. So um, it's Flood Safety Awareness Week in Wisconsin. If you didn't know they're out there, and I didn't know, but Chris Vygasky told me, uh, who's the program manager for WiscoNet, 
And I guess we're, you know, interested, you, you touched a little upon this, I think, in your remarks, but how, how do those additional rainfall and even the soil moisture measurements help support that flood forecasting and warnings across the state? Maybe you can give us a little bit deeper glimpse into that. So with the, the WiscoNet data having five minute temporal resolution, we're going to be able to see up to the minute how hard it's raining and identify the areas at risk. So especially urban areas can't take as much rain. If, if they get an inch an hour, that can cause a lot of issues, a lot of standing water, flooding water on streets. And having that density of the network, we can get a feel for which areas are getting more rain than others. And soil moisture too, on the flip side, um, seeing how wet or how dry the soil is. If it's been several days of rain, the soils are pretty saturated, your threshold is lower for how much additional water you can take. So the flood risk is greater. But if you had several days of dry water, dry weather, soils are drier. We also uh, monitored the drought. So, you know, looking at how many days it's been dry, how long of a dry stretch has it been, um, you know, the flood risk may be a little bit lower if it's been dry. Of course, if it rains a lot, it doesn't matter. You still could have that flood risk, but just the resolution of this data is is huge. That we're filling a lot of holes where we didn't have sensors before. So that's that's going to lead to better flash flood warnings, more information for for public safety to get that hazard out there, to get that risk out there for everyone. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, you are next. Um, I guess I'm curious to know a little bit about, are there particular products or observations that, you know, are part of Mesonet that your office might be more interested? I mean, you guys are sort of the clearinghouse for uh, lots of data, but is there something like, you know, you jump up and like, oh, we, we don't have a lot of information about that. And we're really excited to finally start, start having that moving forward. Yeah, so a couple of things in particular, I mean, you listed the various weather and um, soil data that are coming through WiscoNet, but two in particular, one I, I mentioned earlier, the soil moisture, uh, that's so important because it's, it's, you know, I didn't realize until a year ago when I became state climatologist that their soil moisture data is not very good. When you look at, at you know, top of the line information online, these products don't even agree with each other. I learned that last year during the drought and one product would say this area is wet and another product would say it was dry. Uh, what do you do with that? Uh, and so having quality soil moisture data would be huge. And another one that's different that WiscoNet provides that is not just run of the mill weather data that you could get from say the, the Dane County airport is solar radiation. Uh, and that can be very important as I indicated during, during heat waves. But it's also something that we thought about last summer when we had all that wildfire smoke. And I just was thinking, wow, how much are we curtailing the solar radiation right now? And what impact, if any, is it having on agriculture? And farmers were asking the same thing. And it's complicated. It turns out that uh, the, that wildfire smoke does cut down on direct solar energy. Uh, and that can be a negative for crops. On the other hand, it increases diffuse radiation, solar radiation, and so it scatters it more. That can lead to better penetration of solar energy into the canopy, which can benefit crops. It's complicated. Um, so having good quality solar radiation data can be really helpful in a way that I didn't fully appreciate because we didn't have this network and we didn't have the solar uh, data uh, to go by. But then last summer it was just a natural experiment. Nobody expected but solar energy and smoke was on everybody's minds, right? A new door, and I, I, <laughs> I'm not alone, right, in terms of the impacts on crops. So those are a couple examples of things that are like, wow, this is really going to be a great and a game changer for Wisconsin. Thanks for that perspective. Yeah. Uh, Amanda, let's talk a little bit about the, the growers and sort of their, their need for new products and new information, you know, to help, as you're pointing out, to guide them. Do you, do you get the sense that, you know, uh, they've been asking for, for more, you know, since you've been here at UW? I know, you know, your group and others here have been helping provide some decision support tools directly to them, and, and that's been great. But, yeah, what, what are you hearing out there in the landscape? Yeah, it's a great question, Chris. Um, and I, I'll point to an article that, that you prepared um, and 
and I think presented to the the potato and vegetable growers at a at a, a winter educational meeting, and maybe now it's been close to seven or eight years ago. Um, but you had looked at other states, right? And you compared the automated weather networks of other states to what we had here in Wisconsin. And the growers sort of felt like, well, why why not us, right? When I mean, why do we not have this type of a rich network? And and so I, I would say in, in my career here, 15 years, that's sort of been the sentiment. And that is, why do we not have uh, something better? Why do we not have something for the research community um, to work off of, um, for the, the industry to benefit from, um, for so many reasons, and many listed here today? Um, so uh, there's certainly been the need. Uh, within my own program, when I, I started in 2009, um, I sort of inherited a, a mobile weather station network uh, mobile in that each year we would put out an independent weather station within a, a potato field in four locations and we would generate uh, forecasts for growers uh, to help them manage uh, late blight, which is a, a disease you probably all heard of in history class if nowhere else. Um, and that is a disease that was a causal agent of the Irish potato famine in the, the mid 1800s and is still with us today, although we haven't seen it here in the state for two years. Uh, but we we forecast the conditions that will favor late blight, and then we let growers know when it's time to do something about that. Um, so all commercial potato varieties are susceptible to the late blight pathogen. We know a lot about how to make them resistant, but that is a it's a biotechnology that's not acceptable in our in our uh, marketplace at this time. And so we do rely upon fungicides for management of late blight. And that network would inform growers of when it was time, when we had the right weather. Um, and the right crop status to to favor the onset of late blight if the pathogen was present. And so that's helped us out tremendously over the last 15 years and prior to myself, uh, Emeritus Professor Walt Stevenson had a network like that for 20 years prior, right? So um, we had an established uh, communication network with our farmers. Um, in the last few years, we've further developed um, a larger uh, usage of a, of a mesonet that um, it comes to us through um, uh, NOAA, um, and we, we've accessed those data to uh, give on a 12 kilometer grid um, access to, to farmers around the state of Wisconsin that, that blight cast or late blight forecasting tool. Um, but that, of course, is only made better by having the, the Wisco net stations uh, to validate that, um, that NOAA network. Uh, so we're very pleased to have these additional stations. Uh, but that's uh, that's the word from the growers. They're very appreciative of this network um, and excited. One of the stations, we recently um, uh, resolved this, but one of the stations will be at a um, the food um, and um, a food and, and exploration uh, center up in Plover. And that is a it's a grower led hands on uh, learning center uh, to teach uh, kindergarten through um, technical college level um, youth about Food production in Wisconsin, and there'll be a station there, so it'll also expand the, the informational network, which is fantastic. Great, Great. Th thanks. Um, so, last but not least, Megan. Uh, so, I just want to probe a little bit more into the the energy area, and you know, being a DOE and that, I'm hoping you might be able to lend a little bit of, um, I want to say, an answer to. I'm thinking solar radiation data, wind information is like critical. And, you know, as you're saying, people are, are, you know, waiting for this. I think what myself and the team is trying to figure out is, is it going to be as easy as them, like just going to the website and pulling data down? Or are there some specialized products that they might have an interest in? Could anything you can shed light on there <laughs> great question great question you know and i was thinking also the the flooding data and the you know just in terms of you know, hydro dams right like hydroelectric power is still a huge source of power and in fact uh pumped hydro is our largest energy storage in the country you know to date and a lot of that is natural uh formations but in terms of you know our grid operators using this data right now uh, and if you go to the the MISO website they'll sort of show you like they use this proprietary blend of NOAA and all these different uh, services and they really actually last year put out a challenge just to to say listen we we need to do this differently this you know using uh, sort of part of this forecast and blending in this data is differently so I, I do think that um, those independent system operators or those ISOs 
are going to be looking to to tap right into these networks, right? Like like why it makes sense for Sarah. You know, it comes right to her dashboard. She can get that five minute data because you need. I mean, the the ISOs are predicting demand hour by hour a day ahead and and seven to ten days ahead. They need to understand that. So. You know, one example is in uh, summer of 2016, big thunderstorm hits Hartford, Connecticut. Temperatures in Boston drop to the 60s. This is July in the city, right? So what ISO New England thought was going to happen is people would be sitting there with their air conditioners on sweating. And people turned off their air conditioning. And you don't think about this as a problem as much as a consumer. You're like, what? I'm saving energy. But actually, if you have too much energy on the system, you can destroy things as much as not having enough energy on it, right? You have to, you have to be able to ramp things down. And that's one of the things that can be more difficult with renewable energy versus these combined cycle plants that we're so used to, you know, coal plants, we can ramp them up, ramp them down. But that's obviously, you know, not. There's a lot of other reasons why we don't want to burn coal or methane. Um, we need this more granular data. And, and I would guess that we will need it in a product to go to those, those grid operators so that they can really understand it. Because even the soil health stuff is just really fascinating to, to kind of understand. Maybe you don't need that minute by minute, but to understand, do I have a substation in, you know, I, I've been using the wiki maps and the Wisconsin Energy Security Plan for years because they show us, you know, 50 years out, what, are our, what is our floodplain? We have to think about that, even though we don't do integrated resource planning in this state anymore, and I won't get on my high horse about that. But um, it would be helpful if everyone sat down together and said, hey, this is going to be in the floodplain in 50 years. What are we going to do today when we have mitigation dollars, when we're building the clean energy grid of the future, rather than going, oh, whoops, 2018 happens and we get nine inches of rain at once and, you know, there's not a wastewater treatment facility built for that in the world. Oh, I slipped it in. Um, but also, we're, we're losing substations. We've got bridges breaking. So um, to answer in short, you bet. I think we should definitely think about different products for the energy industry and particularly um, the clean energy transition. Great. Thanks. Appreciate that. So I think we should go to the online. Do we have some questions? So the, the yeah, thank you. So the question is placement of the stations. How are we deciding in this vast land that we have where the stations are going in each county. And um, I'm actually going to let Chris Vygaski talk a little bit about this. <laughs> He's the program manager for WiscoNet. Okay, well, this is something that I've been working on almost since day one, uh, which is trying to figure out where are we going to put all these stations. Wisconsin, believe it or not, is the size of many small countries in this on this planet. Uh, so we've got a lot of land to cover. Uh, Sarah and Steve talked about the existing network. So there's the airport weather stations, there's uh, remote automatic weather stations that are used for fire weather. So there are weather stations out there. So where are we going to put these new ones to really benefit you know, the people and the growers and everybody who needs this weather data? And what we've been doing is drawing circles around existing weather stations that are about 20 miles in diameter or uh, 20 miles in radius and saying, is there a weather station somewhere near here? If not, that's where we're going to focus first and foremost. And we're trying to fill those gaps this year so that we've got the biggest gaps filled. And then next year we can find good places in counties that already have good coverage to give even better coverage. And then the year after that, so 2026, looking at who needs more data on top of the already good data that is now out there in Wisconsin. So hopefully by the end of 2026, everybody in the state is within 20 miles of a high quality weather station, which is gonna provide so much benefit for these mesoscale weather phenomena like severe thunderstorms, flash flooding, winter yeah. storms, but also give really important information for the growers so they have you know, that important soil moisture, soil temperature, leaf wetness data just down the street instead of two counties over. And so it's a, it's a big process that we've been working on. 
uh, for about 11 months now, but uh, I think we've been quite successful at it so far and we're only going up from here. A good host site. Well, we want the weather station to be somewhere that it's in the elements. You know, a weather station is made to really measure the weather. And if you have it somewhere sheltered, you're not getting that really high quality data that is, is needed. So we would like to be about 100 feet or more away from obstructions. So tall trees, buildings, concrete, so that you get the accurate wind measurement, so that you're not getting artificial inflation or cooling of temperatures and so that the precipitation measurements which are extremely important aren't getting interfered with as well another quick follow-up uh just are you thinking about where there's clusters of agriculture we saw the kiwani peninsula you know i want to advocate for antigo and potato country a little bit here we're we going to get some more sensors over there yeah that and that's where you know, we are looking at targeted expansion. So, you know, the Door Peninsula with the, the cherry and apple growers, they're, you know, they've got their own Wisconsin micro net right now with eight stations there. Um, the Central Sands region, uh, the cranberry growing regions, anywhere where there's a lot of agriculture that could really benefit from that additional data, we're looking at those locations for supplementary or additional stations. And that would be you know, the 2025-2026 the period after we've filled all the big data gaps. I, I just wanted to mention we do have, um, through the UW Agricultural Research Station system, um, there are uh, uh, data uh, or weather data stations at each of those. So um, that's been nice to, th that fills in some of the agricultural uh, locational gaps as well. So the question is about snowpack measurements and will those be available? So um, right now, um, unfortunately, no. Um, and it's a little more of a, a complicated uh, measurement to make and the equipment that can be used to do that is quite expensive and a little cost prohibitive for our network. But I don't know, Sarah, do you want to comment on kind of how that's generally done? So like Chris said, it, snow measuring snowpack or snow depth is very complicated. There is uh, satellite data out there that that does pretty well at measuring um, estimating the amount of water content in snow so that's something that you know it's out there that's that's available um, but we at, at the weather service we rely on other networks for snow uh, snow cover and snow depth there's a lot of volunteer weather networks where people can take some training, find a good place to set up their gauge and just take actual measurements with the ruler to measure snow depth or take a snow core with a cylinder from the official Kokoraz rain gauge, stick that in the ground, melt that down and get the snow water content of the snowpack there. So sometimes just the old fashioned way of measuring snow is actually very helpful um, because yeah, it's just a challenge with automated equipment to measure that snow depth and, and water content. But if you're interested, the Coco Raz, the Community Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, C-O-C-O-R-A-H-S dot O-R-G, is a program that we work closely with where citizens can send in their snowfall reports, and it's it's available online for anyone to use. So that's something that, I mean, I look at that every day to assess the how much rainfall or how much the, the snow there is. Okay, how about in the room here? Any of the audience have any questions you'd like to ask? Yeah. So the the question is if uh, there's you know partnerships between some of the the industry for some of the crops that are grown and and uh, some of the, the researchers and other things going on. Oh, Amanda, you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, in in some instances, yes. Uh, some of the the larger farming operations um, they have their own weather stations. In fact, they they'll have one per you know eighty acre field unit, um, and um, and that's very useful. Uh, but uh, on some of those operations, that's 
it's internal data, right? And they they um, they consider it proprietary to their operation, right? So it's not accessible to the research community or to the the larger larger uh, grower network. Um, and so tools like this are are, are really at a, at a at a premium to serve all producers, right? Not just those that might have the resources to invest in a um, their own uh, network uh, system, but um, but in terms of having a, um, a sort of a privatized uh, region-wide or statewide network, I'm, I'm not aware of anything like that in, in the agricultural framework. Um, there are some uh, you know, professional crop consultants that will have some stations out and around, but it's, it's at discrete locations on the farms they serve. Yeah, I would say if 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 there was one, we would have known about it. Maybe you know, I don't think you can keep something like that secret. You know, if it's that large of a network. But yeah, a lot of, you know, from what I've learned, a lot of the, the growers, you know, do will have a weather station on their farm or maybe a network. I mean, there's some uh, farms operations on Central Sands where I've heard about uh, many many stations and lots of soil moisture data being collected um, to help them guide their irrigation uh, decision making in that region because it's so critical uh, to the final product and the end of season yield. Um, so this will help supplement some of that. You know, we're hoping not everybody and not every farmer in the state can afford. And again, the, the, the quality of the data and then the ability to know when it's not collecting good data. I mean, that that's just not something that is just easy to find. I've got a research grade weather station in my own backyard. And sometimes I have a hard time determining what's going on out there with a background in meteorology. Um, and, it, and it requires upkeep. You know, you have to stay on top of it. Um, so we're hoping to, to overcome some of that. Um, so any, yeah, go ahead. Sure. So uh, the, the question has to do with difficulty and maybe maintaining and, and sort of problems we, we might be facing. And then a follow up to that is any other types of uh, measurements that we'd, we'd like to be making. I'll give my own perspective. I'm going to let the other Chris give his give him time to think and then he can spout out his wish list and we'll talk. We'll talk dollars then. But uh, I guess the first thing has been um, in, in terms of uh, upkeep is just as you build the network and it becomes bigger uh requires more people hours and, and time to be checking on uh those stations and i mean the, the way that the network you know is designed and will work is that we'll know when a sensor is inoperable or giving a, a bad reading and eventually needs to be fixed or replaced and um, if that happens to be up in bayfield and it's a six hour drive i mean you sort of get the the picture that as this network scales up and becomes larger, it becomes inherently more difficult to keep track of everything. And so it, it really comes down to a, a dollars and, and money and, and investment type of deal. And, you know, we're, we're operating on a, a limited budget, you know, right now. And, and I don't know what the future holds, but some of that uncertainty is what keeps me up at night because I certainly don't want to go through the effort of building up a network and then, you know, years down the, a few years down the line say, hey, guess what? I guess we, we didn't have enough support or people saying, hey, we really need that and we need to figure out how to maintain that and here's how we're going to do that and maybe not rely so much on uh, government grants and, and things like that to do so. Um, your second question about um, you know, other measurements, you know, that, you know, are being made, you know, I feel like we, we have sort of the, the, the gamut, you know, that we really need, but I'd like there to be cameras out there, um, for phenology and wildlife and biodiversity and things like that. And eventually we might be able to get there. I think the, the sonic, there's some sonic sensor, sensors that can look downward at the snowpack and, and give you some information, but, Honestly, as, as Sarah's describing, it's it's difficult, you know, and then you might think, oh, that with 72 or 80 or 90 stations, you're getting a good representation, you know, maybe which is true, but it is still measuring just one point 
on the landscape. And then if like there's a drift here or certain wind field, we all see it in our yards, which is a little exaggerated if you live in a city, given how chaotic the wind can be. But if you live in the countryside, you can also get some pretty weird stuff going on too. So um, I don't know, Chris, have you thought long enough about what you want to put out there and how much it's going to cost us? Yeah, so I'll, I'll touch on the, the first uh, question here. Um, and, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, it, I mean, it's a lot of a lot of windshield time to, to get out to all the, the different stations. And I mean, you have to, you have to have somebody that really likes to be on, on the road and likes to be outside and, you know, likes to, to get their hands dirty and, and do things like that. And yeah, Caitlin here has been a, a fantastic uh, resource for us in the uh, seven months or eight months that she's been with us now. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that we're going to have to to keep working on and keep looking at as we, get to 70, 80, 90 stations. We were talking about that in a, a phone call today. How many stations are your techs maintaining? And it's generally 40 stations per per tech. So as we get to where we wanna be, that could be hiring another person. Where are we going to locate spare parts? Do we use some of the ag research stations as staging areas. So we go to Spooner for the Northwestern part of the state or you know, PARS for the Northeastern part. Um, and, and how do we do that? So that's, you know, some of the things that, that Caitlin and I think about is how we're going to maintain things as we, as we continue on. And my, my big item on the, the wish list, um, and you know, Steve touched on this a little bit would be air quality sensors, um, that can do uh, particulate measurements, ozone and um, some of the other you know, noxious gases or, or things that we don't necessarily want to be breathing in. Um, the, the DNR has a few reference grade stations around in uh, parts of the state, but you know, the, the big thing when we have air quality alerts in the, the spring, summer, into the fall is for particulate matter, wildfire smoke and ozone. So if we could have a wider swath of sensors that measure those two things in particular, we could really support some of those advisories that come out from the DNR. Thanks, Chris. Great uh, perspective. Other questions from the audience here? Yeah, go ahead. So the, the question is, do we have any plans to deploy a, a station at a uh, wind or solar farm? And we do have tentative plans to put one at the Kaganza uh, solar farm research facility that's uh, going up uh, near Stoughton, affiliated with a Alliant and the university here. Um, that's a starting point. Um, outside of that, I don't know, Chris, if you've been in touch with anybody else or not. Uh, not yet. Um, with solar, it's a lot easier uh, because, you know, the, the solar panels are, you know, a meter, two meters above ground. With wind, it's a lot tougher. Our wind sensors are at 10 feet. Uh, wind operators want to know what the wind is at 150, 250, 350 feet. So there's not a good correlation between our wind speeds and the wind speeds that they would be interested in. Um, but certainly, you know, for small uh, solar producers, um, we just visited a, a winery uh, last week and they run on a lot of solar. Um, so having that solar data right there where they're, you know, generating solar would be beneficial for them. Great. Any, yeah. Sure. So the, the question is about the, the longevity of the stations and, you know, the, the core, the, the, the tripod and some of that other stuff, not the sensors itself, hopefully we last decades or could last decades. Um, the sensors themselves, I mean, you know, we're hoping, you know, probably three to five years, maybe a bit longer. Um, Chris actually came from an instrumentation company, uh, Visola, before he came and joined us. And 
I don't know what what's your thought on the likely longevity before replacement. You know that is going to depend a lot on you know, how we maintain and how we keep up with the the sensors. Um, so we'll have plans in place for having spares so that we can do periodic replacements so that we can send sensors in for calibration and repair um, so that we, we take the sensor off, we send it back to the company that manufactured it, they give it a once over, they replace components and they send it back to us. Um, so hopefully they will be able to last for at least as, as long as the, the tripods and, and things do, unless they come out with new technology, better technology that would be you know, more beneficial for us to have, and then we'll replace those sensors. But you know, that's probably the, the biggest challenge in maintaining a network like this is not necessarily in deploying everything. Um, we were, were given a, a good amount of funding to deploy everything, and you know, there's people practically fighting over can we put it on my land versus across the street on my neighbor's land um, sort of thing, but it's the maintenance and the upkeep. And that's really what's the most important thing is, you know, after we get it out there, how do we make sure that data is always good? And that's where the calibration and the maintenance and the repairs come in. Um, and so a yearly, uh, every two years, every three years, depending on this, uh, the sensor, that's you know the the kind of calibration and maintenance program that we're going to have to put into place. No, we could very easily um, replace different components with. Uh, newer or uh, better sensors. And um, that's something that I'm always looking at. Caitlin's always looking at, you know, we are always talking with sensor manufacturers about what they're working on, what they've got, what's new, what's great, what's better, um, so that we can always make sure that we're at the forefront of technology. Because, you know, I want WiscoNet to be a network that other states look at and say, let's do what they're doing that other countries can look at and say, we don't have a weather network, but Wisconsin's the same size as us. We can do what they did. Um, so really, you know, let that Wisconsin idea shine and get out there so that others can say, Hey, they did it. We're the same size. We can do that. And then they come and they reach out to us and say, can you tell us how you did it? Can you give us some advice? Other questions in the room here or on anything online? Nope. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Question, but um, it, one thing that we haven't talked about that I think WiscoNet could be really helpful for is education. Uh, so, you know, we've talked about all sorts of different applications, which are great and, and worthy, but boy, just imagine with um, an online consistent network across the state, you could really get, I mean, adults too, but I'm thinking kids, interested in science this way. Wisconsin, I mean, we're not the Rocky Mountains, but we've got a lot of interesting geography in our own right. We're bordered by two of the Great Lakes. We've got the Driftless area, really hilly. We've got sandy soils. We've got lakes, you know, remnant lakes. We've got all sorts of stuff here. Uh, you know, just from my own experience studying weather and climate here, it's fascinating. You know, there's so many questions that could get students interested in weather and climate like why in this vegetated county is it so much cooler on this hot day and why did this area of the state dry out so much more than another i've always wondered why is western wisconsin so much more hot and humid during heat waves than even the south where i live all sorts of things you could get kids interested in not just about weather and climate but hopefully interested in science too and this could be a gateway uh, to try to really spur interest in, um, in, in science generally, but education at all. And this by having a, a consistent network around Wisconsin with real-time information and, and graphical data, I think it could just be a, a big hit in schools and with, with kids and, and adults as well. So anyway, I'm on my soapbox, but yeah, this is just another benefit of this network. Thank you. The, the other comment I wanted to make uh, with respect to uh, some of the solar radiation sensors is that um, there there's there has been substantial modeling work done that 
t tells us how plants respire, right? It tells us how plants are um, are active and metabolizing and and using water. And so, you know, in agriculture, this this has application, but it has applications in in um, really any system that has plants growing within it. But it gives us information about uh, groundwater um, retention and sustainability. And so, it's just one element that hadn't been covered yet. And I just wanted to share that too that. Uh, a weather station network gives us uh, substantially additional information, um, and we we hadn't yet talked about uh, groundwater quality. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. You started with solar radiation, which made me think about the Kiganza project too, where they're doing agrivoltaics, right? So, not that this is a normal thing you would do with the mesonet, but we interesting to me to understand. And maybe we're going to learn from just how the plants grow. But what is the radiation that's coming through? those, you know, right, because we know we can grow kale and broccoli and all kinds of things. Um, and I don't know if that's part of the research you guys are doing, because it, it seems like a great project. And again, there's a lot of people out here saying, oh, solar panels are taking all our farmland. But if we can grow crops, and maybe even, you know, to your point about the wildfire smoke, if we can grow them better, because they're not so much, so much intense sun on them. Uh, that could be a huge win, you know, for clean energy in the state. Yeah, just to, to follow up on that, Megan. Um, yeah, so the I'm working with a, a small team of researchers as a, one of these exploratory grants from the university to look at some of the things you're talking about, agrovoltaics, you know, how well are things growing? Are certain plants adapting to the shaded environment? What is it doing to the hydrology? Basically, how water is coming down and then running off, you know, the landscape as they're, they're pre preferentially drier and, and wetter areas. There's going to be an eddy covariance tower out there that's measuring the fast exchange of carbon, uh, water vapor, and and basically energy fluxes between the land surface and the lower atmosphere. And that's being led by Ankur Desai, professor and, and chair in atmospheric sciences here. So a lot of cool stuff. We'll get our weather station out there. We'll take the background readings, and then the rest of us will dive into the, the nitty-gritty details. But um, so... Sarah, do you have any closing comments before we kind of wrap things up? Anything you'd like to add or any other questions of these guys or? Guess I'm just really looking forward to seeing more data come online, more stations come online. And, and I think Chris, you've mentioned before the online component, more data available there, like maybe more, charts or interactive things or we can look at the data that way too i think that might be really helpful too on, on my end just kind of see it different you know a different perspective since we do look at it in our system kind of spatially but to have all that data online and customizable type platform you know is really exciting but yeah this is really exciting to hear all the other uses that everyone is using with this data and yeah this is great Yeah, and I'll just uh, say one one last thing. Um, you know, it's it's taken a huge team effort to get there. And um, one of the person, David Henry, uh, sitting in the back of the room, who those of you online can't see, but he's in the room. He's the web developer for Mesonet, uh, the Wisconet. And uh, he started in February of 2023. And we basically said, we need a website up in four months to have all that data out there. And, and somehow he pulled it off. Um, but I'm just, you know, between David's work and, and Caitlin and, and Chris, um, it's been a, a really a great team to work with. But also the rest of you in terms of your support and input, and it's just growing and it's it's reinvigorating. And it, that helps me sleep a little better at night when I'm thinking about how to keep this all going. As Chris is saying, well, you know, the, these things have to be recalibrated. And I'm like, you know, when I had the idea, it just sounded so much fun to build a weather network. And have one in each county and we really need this as, a, as amanda was saying the growers were were pointing out like why not us i'm like we need this but it, it took a long time to sort of get the attention of the right people and have those opportunities and so we're there and i just want to keep that momentum building so i think uh, there's a lot of vested interest in it and it's it's nice to know that you know we're all in it together and we're, we're going to get there we'll we'll get it figured out so Anyway, I want to thank you guys for all your time and uh, uh, sitting and, and listening and, and giving some perspective, too. I know we're all busy, so you got some closing remarks? 
Thanks, Chris, and thanks to all our panelists. Um, just a reminder, again, our next forum will actually be in April. Uh, April 23rd, we'll do a hybrid version again here. We've got folks in the room uh, on the history and future of uh, uh, energy research at UW-Madison. And again, um, please join us uh, this Saturday for the Kidwin Challenge from 10 to 12 at the Discovery Building. We've got a public science expo. So hope to see you all back for our next uh, uh, event. And uh, thanks again. We'll see you in a little bit.